Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Rowing Chat podcast. I'm Rebecca Caro, and do you know, it's been thir- since 2013, we've actually been broadcasting on this channel, and I couldn't be happier by the unbelievable growth in new members. We have got listeners coming in from all over the world, from countries that don't speak English. Welcome to you all. Could I ask you to do one thing if you're listening to this episode today, and that is to share it onto social media, tagging a friend who you think might like to listen. I'd be very grateful. Now, Rowing Chat happens thanks to sponsors. And one of the things we're trying to do this month, July, is to build a giant help page for rowing retailers. We'd like to help them recover from the effects of the lockdown. And we're going to build a giant rowing sale page. We'd like to feature as many rowing products, companies and service providers as possible. So if you can send us a link to your favorite rowing product, if you're a rowing retailer or coach or gym or any sort of service provider, send us your information, share your catalogue with us, and we're going to go and get this page built, and then we'll tell you all about it when it's live. Now, today, my guest on Rowing Chat is Robin Dowell. Robin, welcome to your first podcast. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm quite uh, quite excited about it and uh, looking forward to having some good conversation. Now, you and I first met in Marlow when I was um, a member of the local rowing club there and you were working at the high school, but a lot of people may not recognise your name. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell the listeners a little bit about your personal background in this wonderful sport of rowing? Yeah, so, well, it's uh, quite a a long story uh, for a... uh, quite a young person, I like to think still. Um, and uh, I think it starts, Rebecca, with, uh, you know, just going back to, to school and to university where we've had, uh, you know, where I had really fantastic coaches from a lot of sports. And, uh, you know, starting off as a, a swimmer and a hockey player. And, uh, you know, main, swimming became my passion. Yeah, from about fourteen or fifteen, and uh, and and things started to develop, and um, you know, got quite quite serious uh, relatively. Um, yeah. And it, go on. <clears throat> wow, I was just laughing about the relativity remark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that you know that would be something that I would encourage the listeners to to take with them as well because. Um, you know, whether you're a full-time athlete um, training professionally or you're training three times a week as a junior athlete, um, you know, it's always important to you. It's your passion and you do it because you love it and you want to do the best you can. So I would always remind people that, you know, whoever you're talking to, it's it's really important for them Uh their success and their progress and you know it's uh the coach's job to help you have a great journey and keep coming back um so yeah you know swimming you know when i reflect upon it now i ended up in a in a swimming pool training with a a guy that was a world champion or became a world champion and a guy that became a commonwealth champion and record holder for 50 meters backstroke so you know some people that follow swimming might know the names Liam Tancock and Matthew Clay. Uh, and I happened to be the third guy uh, yeah. <laughs> swimming with them. And uh, luckily for me, I, I uh, changed sports. Um, so, yeah, thing, things developed through university. I, I captained my, my university swimming team and then was president of the swimming club. Um, and actually, it was the the job of uh, Alison Knowles, who was in the British Women's Eight for quite a long time. Um, she she was a swimmer and uh, she transferred to, to rowing and she had a great time uh, and it really changed the path of her life. 
uh, and she just kept saying to me, you're not fast enough and you're not good enough at, <laughs> at swimming. Um, you, yeah, you really would enjoy it enjoy rowing um why don't you give it a, give it a go um so i started turning up and playing around in boats uh and uh, i think the rest they say is history but um that was mainly due to a, a guy called uh, peter shakespeare uh who who was a talent id head of the world class start program uh and he tested me and got me involved and uh i started training training in uh dark totness uh with uh will hawkyard bill lucas um and uh and things progressed really from there um i i moved on to to manchester after my uh graduation where i uh i was rowing with uh, Hamish Burrell, who was uh, another start coach, and now he's uh, obviously with the the lightweights. Um, and that was at Agecroft Rowing Club, so a really you know great provincial northern club, and with big you know big ambitions. And it was always a great energetic place to be and a great place to train. So that was a big part of you know the next step for me, I guess from from being a, a university student and learning how to skull. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, moving on from there, you know, I was uh, a few years out of university, been rowing for, for about three years then. And um, went to my first British senior final trials, which at the time was in uh, Harswinkle <clears throat> in Belgium. So everyone get on the get on the bus uh, and and drive over there, and um, and and that was a great experience. You know, I remember getting off the you know getting off the coach and seeing Andy Hodge and Pete Reed and these guys looking, to be honest, cool, calm, and collected when I was uh, starry eyed and absolutely terrified. Um, uh, and we weren't so different in age, you know. We're not we're not that different in age, but my my journey was so far behind theirs in terms of only just basically only just starting and really wanting to be to be there. Um, raced okay, got beaten by some some youngsters that went on to be uh, you know Olympic medalists and uh, world champions and. Uh, Olympic medalists, Olympic champions, and but for me that was just such an important learning curve of truly reaching a relative point of performance and understanding, really understanding what it meant, you know, to be amongst world class people, um, and trying to just learn everything I could from that experience. Um, when I when I I didn't make it into the to the senior team that season, but um, upon returning to the UK the week after, there was a like a, a talent a world class start camp where we would do some racing, uh, and the under twenty threes would be doing some testing at the same time, uh, and these camps would run in parallel. So the world class start athletes and the junior trials were run at Dorney and uh, under 23 testing and senior testing or new senior testing would be run at Caversham. Um, somebody in the under 23 and new senior testing got got uh, ill, uh, had a migraine and so they needed a sub substitute um, and actually I was the only, I was the next ranked person uh that rode stroke side <laughs> that was Ooh. around <laughs> um so i got called to go from well we're staying at bisham abbey but instead of going to dorney with the rest of the start athletes i would go to to caversham and take part in my uh my first lot of real seat racing um <laughs> without having done any sweep for a few months <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that that actually went pretty well. Um, got asked to come back the next day uh, and do it again. Uh, and then I went back up the well, M 
six <laughs> uh, to uh, to Manchester, and um, and I didn't think anything of it. And then on Monday morning, turned up for training, and uh, Henry said to me, "Oh, I've had a phone call. You know, there's a project going to be a European Men's Eight. Um, it will be going till September." you did a good job you won your, your races and would you would you like to to do it and I, he he was sort of saying well you don't get asked twice so you exactly. either go now or you stop turn around heads up young man <laughs> yeah so um so for me that was more or less moving to the thames valley um and and so i packed up my stuff that after well, i gave uh don mclaughlin a call who was going to be running the project uh and i was going to be rowing out of reading university in a four um until that summer and uh and i basically he said oh you know there's no rush don't worry about it you get down and he said so when can you come and i said well i'll be there tomorrow uh so I moved down. My my mum lives in Bournemouth, and uh, and so actually I moved to Bournemouth, uh, just outside, and then I commuted every day uh, oh, up and down. Drive. That's an, an hour yeah. and a half. Yeah, an hour, about an hour and a half. Uh, so I actually did that for most of the sum most of the summer. So I did it from Easter until around August. Yeah. So, and when the senior team went to the Olympics, so this was 2008, um, Hester Goodsell actually let me have her room in her house when she went away on training camp. Oh, nice. So I didn't have to drive all the time, but I couldn't really afford to pay for my food. <laughs> so it sort of worked out better to try and drive home uh and try and get the money for the petrol because the petrol ended up at the time being cheaper than my food bill uh to survive the training <laughs> that's an interesting mathematical model that someone can go and, and figure that one out yeah yeah so um that that was really my you know my uh my formative years of rowing and that, that's what got me really hooked on the performance side of it uh and putting together all these different coaching experiences, you know, from swimming, from, from rowing, from having, you know, really great uh, role models and really great people that were there to just guide you through the, the big challenges. You know, there are days that were, you know, being a self-funded athlete with no particular, uh, particularly large income or any savings. Um, it was a case of trying to, trying to work your way through the the narrows and um once i was living in the thames valley and rowing at reading university uh you know don and will rand uh there were you know fantastic support and and it really was a great few years and that year made the final of the visitors uh which was my you know my second time rowing at Henley and my first Henley final uh which was which was a great experience and you know I would like to say I thought we had a chance of winning and I was proved very wrong in the final um by some club called Leander um ah. and then I started to understand again another level of performance you know at Henley in terms of club rowing and even international as an international stage, especially now with the, you know, it being streamed, it really is a big stage in a high pressure environment. And, and, you know, if, if anyone can get that experience, I would really urge them to, to have a go at qualifying or, you know, just, you know, if you're a master's row, maybe do Henley masters, but it, you know, that experience of being inside the booms, uh, one on one and and getting after it is just something that you you can't really get in any other way in in this sport or almost in any other sport and that's that taste was just like you know fuel on the fire because <laughs> I, I you know I got to final and I never dreamt I'd really be there and then it was just I want a bit more interestingly yeah. just as an aside it's 
Henley at Home this weekend, where yeah. the stewards are taking over the Henley Royal Regatta YouTube channel. And you're invited yeah. to organise your own picnic, your own pims, and to sit yeah. and watch some amazing rowing. So do bookmark that uh, for yourself this weekend coming. Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly in mind. There's a, a few cracking races on the program that I I saw today, and uh, certainly one that I'll be looking forward to was the 2018 Princess uh, Royal final, yes. which is really good. Um, and I'm hoping that there might be a a rerun of a Saturday on 2015, but because it might be one of those hidden gems. But I don't know yet. We'll have to see. <laughs> Uh, if it is yeah i hope it is because i think it's one of the best henley races i've ever seen <laughs> certainly on, from who, who umpires it? Launch. it so william borlase versus uh glasgow academy great and you were right. coaching sir william borlase at the time he, yes and i don't want to say any more if you haven't seen it well maybe wait for the weekend see if it's on there and if not monday or sunday night Get on YouTube and uh, and look it up because uh, you won't be disappointed. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, you know, from from that taste of uh, of Henley, it was like, well, I want a bit more. Uh, and actually, because I've been rowing as Agecroft, uh, as Agecroft, yeah, that ha we had to enter the visitors, even though we would have initially been eligible to race in a club event, the Y folds or, or the yeah. Britannia. Um, so the next year, actually I was registered as a Ortner, you know, alumni club, open club out of Reading university. And there were four of us and we thought we'd have a go at a Cox four because we were all fairly large chaps made sense. The, the numbers said we'd be able to do it. Uh, uh, and that, that was an eventful season. You know, I remember being pulled out of the boat in uh, in Ghent with uh, just blisters on my hand. But yeah, Jürgen Steinecker, the FISA doctor, saw my hand uh, and he said, I have to take you straight to hospital. Uh, you've got a, an infection. And if you row, this this will not end well. Wow. Uh, yeah, that, that was... Uh, and. Consequently, I had intravenous antibiotics. Um, the only downside for my crew was I was driving. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, we yeah we had an interesting journey back. Was um, it one of those, we, change gear now, please? I'll push the car. Luckily, it was an automatic, uh, but it was mainly people kind of poking me and keeping me awake and keeping me entertained. And, and it was really great. I mean, it was a great experience. We made it all safe and sound. Uh, but for me, that was, you know, the next 10, 10, week, 10 days to two weeks of no, no rowing because it was really, you know, you couldn't see my knuckles. Everything was, everything was swollen. Yeah. So, you know, just a little, little lesson uh for people Love especially you. coming off yeah coming off of lockdown you know it's really tempting to just go for it um but you've got to listen to your body in every way and your hands you know you can easily feel like you're being a bit of uh, a wet lettuce but uh i would <laughs> i would say having had the experience of missing out on some some good racing and also you know lose you know i lost 10 kilos of weight in in two weeks um i would really say just look after yourself and the rowing will be there tomorrow um but you know your health and your hands you know they have to be to be there for you to enjoy it <laughs> um so anyway the road to the road to coaching carried on um entered the britannia cup everything looked pretty good uh dealt with the the rounds really well uh was in the final again and i just thought oh well you know it's not you know i mean the level you know the event that's at a level down you know we did well last year we've done well now we've got a good boat good coach good cox good crew yeah and then and then you know not saying underestimated it but you've always got to bring your best <laughs> and and because someone else always will 
and uh and i think that's something that people forget you know they just they make assumptions that maybe you've got a better ergo or you've got a better uh, boat or you know newer equipment and people underestimate that and uh and especially at henley it's you know again it's one-on-one -on -one. there's no time to get your to get your race back uh you know once it's gone it's gone uh so you might have guessed i, I didn't win <laughs> uh or we didn't win um but uh again it was a great experience and, and we lost to absolute class you know uh, james mm -hmm. fode was was in the other crew and yeah you know, obviously mm -hmm. he went on to be pretty good uh and he's still still pretty mm -hmm. good now so uh yeah and uh yeah so but it was great to row again you know when you see people go on and do what they do a bit like my swimming career you realize that you can only do the best that you have with what you've got and if you lose you know if you lose to someone it doesn't make you a worse person or any any less of a an athlete it just means that they're better than you on the day and right. and all you can do is carry on work out where you went wrong and and have another go um so i decided that I've been at Reading University for a few years and I'd lost to Leander once. Uh, I lost to Molsey in the Brit. Uh, and I thought, well, all these guys seem to be rowing in pairs that are getting into the team. They're all, you know, most of the guys at the time were at Leander. I'd rowed with them a bit in my European experience and got on with the guys well. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I need to just take, do something that's right for me. And I knew I, I wanted to win Henley, but I really wanted to be in the British team more. Uh, and maybe if I kept aiming for the British team and gave myself a different environment, uh, where there was maybe more chance of me finding a pairs partner that would suit me yeah. and I would suit them, then, then maybe that would happen for me. And, uh, and so I took that quite hard decision actually at the time because I really didn't know much that much about the club other than my food bill might go down. Um, and, and that obviously all the people that I'd learned about in rowing <laughs> had rowed right. there. So you, you only go there if you, you know, if you back yourself and at the time it was a very, you know, very competitive um place to be where you you know you could be asked to leave uh on a weekly basis <laughs> um so uh i moved there and and that was a really you yeah, know that was a real eye opener and just to be in a group where there were so many guys uh and it was mainly guys there at, at the time uh now there's a lot a lot more women there which is is really good to see and uh and the program's really really growing from from that side um and that just fired me up in the competitive sense so yeah it was just something as every day there was someone to beat it was just fantastic and i uh, i just couldn't believe my luck you know, i was just there and like, oh i can try and beat them and i can try and beat them and i can try and beat them um and it didn't always work out you know uh, you know i remember in the the end of that first uh season there or in the testing you know i really wanted to be in the in the eight that was going to be the top boat the lead boat uh for the ladies play and and i just basically wasn't good enough um uh, wow. I, I managed to only lose one of my uh, only win uh i think one or two seat races which put me still outside of the of the next four mm. um and and so to be honest i was a bit you know i was finding a pair really difficult boat to throw and um, it is. It's, it's one of my favorite boats a pair <laughs> is challenging yeah, yeah uh, and yeah, i have to say it's probably my favorite boat class uh that and coxus four uh okay. and quad um but in terms of the pair when you find someone that you really love to row with in the pair you just never want to let you never want to stop <laughs> and i i was you know had that once or twice um 
and uh, and that was really great but uh this is where the story sort of starts to get really into into coaching for me and uh it was when i ended up in a quad <laughs> uh and i ended up in a quad and i ended up at stroke <laughs> uh and i was like blimey okay and yeah we nicknamed we nicknamed ourselves the comedy quad because we were the biggest uh, we had the guy with the biggest ergo who was the biggest we had a guy that was uh, a small you know quite small guy yeah. who yeah but he could steer uh, the henley course like nobody else he rode there his whole life uh dave dave reed um mm and you know phil turnham was a big guy and then a guy called jack hockley who was at the time a real youngster uh and me so we were a right bunch you know we we looked really strange walking down the Nicholas street together Orkel. you were the, yeah. you were the crew one of everything yeah and uh and somehow I ended up in the stroke seat uh and and sculling in a crew boat that i hadn't done since my first time at henley where i got knocked out in the first round um but this time i well i was hoping that even though we weren't the top boat for mm. the club that we would still be able to do a good performance and the neck what a what a uh, regatta we had and it was you know we were coached by rob morgan mm -hmm. who coached the uh, lightweight four in uh london yeah. uh and it was just great it was uh it was learning all the skills you need it was learning about being a team it was learning about being an underdog it was learning about how to have some skill in the boat uh and it was also then learning how to actually use the power you had and people forget you know it's easy to leave one of those things on the on the pontoon when you push off and to try and only focus on maybe your favorite part of it <laughs> which for most rowers is just burying yourself um, as hard as possible, uh, I would say, or trying your best. Uh, and it's not always about trying your best. It's about doing, delivering the skills that you've done in training and what, you, what you've what you done in, in practice, in all those technical sessions, in all those hard, hard ergo sessions or pieces. It's about trying to put all those things together when you go and race and not trying to do something that you haven't already done <laughs> you know do, doing something special doesn't get you what you want doing what you can do gets you what you want doing what you know sticking to your knitting and it's one of those great truisms that as you really in through a great insight that you pointed out that people frequently forget that the same drills and skills exercises that beginners do are the exact same ones that the elites do because of that exact reason. You've got to be able to execute to a really high proficiency. Yeah, and and yeah, as a coach now, you try and you always try and come up with new ways of skinning the cat and you always end up coming back to the things that you that you really know are the fundamentals because the those are the re you know, those are the reasons why they are the fundamentals is because they give you all the core skills you need and uh and i would never i would never you know discourage someone from going back to the to the very basics and don't you know leave your ego on the on the landing stage and just get in there and have a play five minutes you never know what you unlock when you when you go back to your roots and um and I think that, that that would be another takeaway for me. And that's something that in this in this crew, we, we had to basically start from the beginning every time we got in the boat because we, we just had, yeah, we found a way to get our performances. Um, we found a way to get the boat going, but we really had to always begin in a certain pattern to get us to where we needed to be. Just because, I mean, A, we were so different and B, we were kind of all pretty new to or two of us were new to crew sculling and two two of us were very experienced you know having won the Forley uh race junior quads for their whole you know rowing careers and and were really good scholars so yeah i would just say don't be afraid to go back to basics and don't worry about what other people think about that just just have a go at it and you might just find that you you take a few seconds here and there 
Okay, so I, Did you take I some finished scouts from that regatta. Yeah, so yeah, we took some scouts. Uh, Semi final day was pretty big. Uh, you know, knocking out. Uh, I think it was London Rowing Club and I think it was Commercial, which was a composite from uh, some lightweights from Ireland and Britain from the Olympics from the year before uh who who really you know they put their boat together to ch think they could win this this event and uh we we held them to a i think a canvas and um that was a real buzz and you can still see that on youtube actually uh on the old row tv uh yeah. you'll see me TV. yeah, yes. yeah row.tv and uh, there's some really good uh if you're a bit of a nerd which i hope you are because you're listening to me um uh then then i think that's a really good place to go and you can just dig through some of the archives before it was a drone and before it was you know the spectacle that it is now you can see some really uh amazing you know row throughs and some really amazing turnovers in the in those last parts of the racing and uh you get all the pure commentary as well from the from the grandstand so that's quite a nice feeling the interesting um, thing, if anybody does want to do that, watching other people race can be massively instructive. It's not necessarily about the surprise of who's going to win. But as a coach, if you want to use that as a technique with your athletes, I will often pause a race at a critical point because there is often, particularly in match racing like Henley Roll Regatta, a moment where a decision that one crew does something and that seriously affects the outcome. And in the same way as in tennis, generally speaking, it's when you make a mistake that the other person wins. It's not really that people play out of their socks and do something amazing. It's normally they're both performing at a very, very similar level. And then someone makes a very small error and that's just enough to let the others get their bows in front. And so by pausing a race like that, you can then ask the, your athletes, your, half of you are in this crew, half of you are in that crew, what are you going to do now? How are you going to call the race? What might you try based on what you know? Because you don't know what's going on in that crew because you're not in it. But it's a really great moment. And then you can play out the next you know, quarter of the race and see what happens and then slow-mo it to see whether you can identify what they did differently that affected that outcome. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really good point. It's something that we use with the, the junior crews a lot where we we do a scenario called what ifs, yes. um, where you, you just, yeah, and that was something that you know, Richard Bolton was a big a big fan of and, and it's something that he really, you know, sort of I learned from him in terms of, uh, you know, how we could help a crew make sure they're ready for those sort of scenarios. But in the, in this crew, you know, uh, for this particular race, it was, uh, you know, anything could happen. <laughs> uh, and we, we knew anything could happen as well <laughs> because it had happened. You know, the week before, uh, we'd been doing our last pieces uh, before the circulation at, at Henley changed and we, um, we had the best steersman but we still managed to hit the the bank uh, going up the court or going up the outside of the course, because obviously it's quite busy uh, and on a Saturday morning, uh, Henley, and we we just really wanted to get our or we had to get our last pieces in, uh, and you know from that point we didn't take anything for granted, <laughs> um, and we Glad really that understood. I'm not in the race. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and that held true. So we, we made the final, um, and then we lost to a really quick under twenty three lightweight crew, uh, which went on, which also had some pretty amazing people in. Uh, so uh, Olympic silver medalist and uh, two others that were senior um, or Olympians actually. So two, three Olympians, one Olympic silver medalist. So. Wow. Like I said, it's the story of my rowing, and uh, they follow you know, and my and my swimming. In fact, and even other sports as well. Uh, so there's a chance that if you played against me, uh, the chances are that you 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 probably <laughs> gone to the Olympics, won an Olympic medal, or or a world champion or world record holder. 
So, um, and I, I'm a, I'm really happy to be part of that. Uh, and if I helped you be be the best version of you, then I, I'm I'm all for it. Um, We're going to skip forward uh, a little bit because you did yeah. eventually retire from competitive rowing and become a coach. And yeah. nowadays, Robin, you are principally known for being the coach of Janine Gamelin, the Swiss female single sculler. Yeah. Um, you went through being a national schools level coach at uh, Sir William Borlase Grammar School. You coached with the British Junior Men's Team. But I'd like to move forward to your time working for Switzerland. What was your official title there? Yeah, so uh, at the end of, uh, well, after the Rio, the Rio uh, Olympics, um, there was an opportunity that came up to to go to Switzerland as the, the head coach for, for the whole program, um, which I applied for and consequently then accepted. So I moved there in 2017 uh, in February uh, and started working with the, with the team uh, full time. Um, Tell us a little bit about the Swiss. Um, it's not a, Switzerland is not a very big rowing nation. So how many athletes did you have? So in the, in the, well, on my first day, uh, I, yeah. So this is always a, yeah. For anyone going to any coaching role or any job, you know, whatever it's a new office job or a sales job or anything, you find out what your team is. And on my first day I turned up and there were, uh, there were four people there, <laughs> four athletes, four athletes. Okay. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was good. And I was like, well, this is definitely different to what I expected. Um, uh, and I was like, well, I've just come from, you know, junior trials, you know, working for the British team, yeah. which was a minimum of 40 people at a time, minimum. Yeah. Um, and, and then I was like, oh, four, you know, this is, this is, this is really good. We can, you know, there's a, a woman's single, a lightweight women's double, and there was a, a guy in the single as well who'd been the spare for uh, for the quad for um, for Rio. I was like, oh, you know, well, let's go, let's go rowing. <laughs> um, and I was a, maybe a little bit shocked by not the whole team being up, but some people were away having a break after um, after Rio. They they were reflecting on what they wanted to do next. Some people were, um, you know, the lightweight four was considering their options, although it was unlikely that they were going to gonna return. Um, and then gradually, you know, people started coming in. So the way it works in Switzerland is uh, the program is run from Wednesday to Sunday. Mm -hmm. um in the in the training center and then their mon monday off and then tuesday is training in their own venue right. or, uh, and then back into the center wednesday to sunday uh, and depending on whether people are studying you know some of those people might do thursday to sunday they might do friday to sunday mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of management of of people on different timelines especially in that first year of the of the olympic cycle where where people might take that time to study or they might take that time away with a bit of family time or you know just need that extra bit of mm. flexibility so that was something that i was really aware of and and was a bit of a challenge um however what was clear to me was that the numbers were going to be more or less based around small boats so yeah you know uh, and and so I was very, very keen, especially from my background at the school and certainly in my time as with the British junior team, we took, you know, I remember one, one of the years that I led the, the boys sculling, we took 12 boys and we only took singles on camp mm -hmm. uh, for eight days. So mm -hmm. for junior men wanting to be in a crew sculling boat <laughs> coming on a camp, where you don't get to go in a cruise sculling boat was a bit of a, a mindset change, but it was one that meant that they got a really competitive environment and and hopefully they could learn a bit of where they were lacking that would make the crew a bit better. Um, so we ran we ran the program 
mainly around small boats, uh, mainly singles. Uh, and then, then I found out that there were these training weekends where all the under 23s would come and all the juniors would come as well. So and I went from having, no, then I got a bit more reinforcement. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So Amory Hovold, who, um, she ran, was the Swiss junior coach and now she's coaching the men's four. Um, she, she was running the, the juniors, Edouard Blanc, who is now the, now the chief coach. He was, uh, like under 23, um, army military coach. So there's a, like a, a boat a race program briefly as yeah, well. He was an assistant coach at, uh, Cambridge as well with, uh, Chris Nielsen. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so we, then all of a sudden uh, we had small boats and we could have 40 singles wow. on the water and we ran it men and women all together. Yep. Uh, when we would do the pieces off of a whistle. <laughs> no uh, wonder they do so well when they go and do the silver skiff and the uh, yeah. uh, Armada, <laughs> Armada Cup. Cup. Yeah. Whistle, everybody uh, goes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to be honest, that was really great. And I've got some fantastic photos of, of uh you know those 40 singles lining up and everyone just finding their own level because when you've got juniors under 23s and seniors uh yeah. you know bar the fastest senior man may maybe he still gets a, a bit of a shock on it on the wrong day uh Sorry. by underestimating the one that wants to have a seat um and that was great because you know the the women would get you know level with the junior men have a have a good fight with them and and everyone would would have a, a good session and uh so that was how how i remember the the beginning of that journey and we had a young group of under 23s that we also invited in you know that i then invited into the the senior setup so we had a under 23 women single uh under 23 men's quad who went on to be world champions and world best time holders and then we took them through into the the senior quad um and we had uh, we had an under twenty three four as well heavy heavyweight four uh, which didn't quite make the step but they did a good job at the at the under twenty threes uh, and some of those guys are still in the program now and into the senior four and and doing a very good job so it was a, a really you know well managed project in terms of feeding people through into the into the team and uh, you know, pretty happy with that. But yeah, it was a it was certainly a, a change and and a good one, you know, in terms of being able to hone your skills as a coach. Uh, you know, with the junior team in Britain, you you get to be much more of a manager, uh, an educator, uh, to coaches, to athletes, um, and, and help people. You know, you you have to be the organizer and you know know you know everything about everything that's going to happen you have a lot of support but there's just so much equipment and so many logistics that uh, you drop one you drop one ball in that role and and the whole thing falls down um whereas when you go to run a, a national program where you're coaching every day uh it's just great to be able to have the core the absolute focus being on the athletes and be able to work with them in as much depth as they you know as they need but also they demand yeah. and uh and I, for me that's the most important thing is what does that you know how much does the athlete want to drive their own um progress and their own success really um well, come up to the top of the pile well uh i remember getting an email the week before i arrived um in switzerland saying Oh, is there is there anything that I can do um, before to be ready for when you arrive? Um, you know, I'm very, uh, I'm really ready to get going. I've had my break from the Olympics, and I just I can't wait to to get started. And I was just like, okay, this is good. Uh, and as if it was anyone, uh, you know, because I I never met her. I didn't really know anything about her and 
and I just said, as I would to a school athlete, I just said, well, look, school's not back till next week, so we'll cover it all then. <laughs> uh, don't do anything special, and and let's just sit down and and you know work backwards from what you want and and see. Yeah see what we can do about it and see where you're at and and for me that was a uh, you know it wasn't saying that I wasn't interested I really was but it was also wanting to make sure that the athlete knows that you can't be in a rush like you can only take things one step at a time and as soon as you try and cut those corners that's when uh, that's when you start to lose a bit of grip on your tires and and you can't keep the you know the momentum going on on uh on your projects <laughs> yeah very true and one of a, a lot of in my experience you know ambitious young people are often in a hurry and as you demonstrated yourself with your own description of your personal rowing and the ladder that leads to henley finals you probably would say that you couldn't have made any of those finals if you hadn't have done every single one of those previous steps it's hard to understand yeah. that if you are a athlete effectively doing it for the first time because you are learning as you go along, whereas your coach hopefully has been through those steps before. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say that for from a coach, well, from an athlete point of view, you're so totally right, and uh, and I think that um, everything just builds on the layer before, and if you if you end up skipping a level. Uh, you might get lucky and have some really fantastic people in a crew around you or in your support network that can help you hang on to that. Um, but often you might find that you need to take a little step back before you can then take the next one. Um, from a coaching point of view, I think there's a real strength in learning. Uh, well, from my perspective, there was so many experiences from other sports and from other people's teaching that I've been able to use in my time going to a new experience and going to another new experience and going to another new experience. And just, just uh, like Slumdog Millionaire, you couldn't have answered all of those questions if you hadn't have been in those situations. Yeah, I watched that the other day. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it really, uh, yeah, it is a bit. Yeah, it's a little bit like that, and I really feel like my coach. My, I feel a bit like my coaching career has been, has been a bit like that so far, and uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, and and working, you know, working with, yeah, you know, to be honest, working with all the Swiss athletes has made has has made me a, a better coach. Uh, and working with someone like Janine has challenged me to make sure that I do become a better coach because you know there's a lot of a lot of those things where she had already been already had those experiences and I hadn't so she'd been in a world championship senior a final she'd been to she's been to the olympics um I've lived with someone that went to the olympics <laughs> um but um uh, and but I have so many experiences from from swimming and from the environment those environments that are also or could be seen as sometimes more stressful in some ways than than row rowing races okay. um because you know you have a, a much smaller window of time to make your impact um and also you know those experiences at henley with 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 multiple crews as an athlete and multiple crews as a coach or in these really finely balanced races. And yeah. that, that for me, that's how I see, you know, I mean, all the races now at world championship level, you know, the, the qualifying regatta was, was really intense. And, um, and I'm sure that when racing resumes, it will be as intense in a, in some way or another um but i don't expect it to be drastically different um and i feel like that combination of skill you know skills and experience between the coach athlete team yep. it was is really valuable and i would urge coaches and athletes to make sure that you 
you don't leave anything unturned. Like if you've got skills, especially junior athletes and junior school coaches and even masters athletes and, you know, especially at those ends of the spectrum, um, if you're working with in an elite team, you probably know what each other has been through probably. (laughs) But if you're working at the other ends, you know, you might be dealing with someone that used to play a different sport that has so many transferable qualities uh, Mm -hmm. into whatever your your and so many skills um that they can use in the crew or in the club that you're that you're in that you just don't know about unless you really start to you know be a bit of a deeper community and ask the questions and really make sure people are are going after their own relative performance i guess is is what i would say yeah that that's sort of where we came at the beginning and and yeah again in junior rowing you've got an awful lot of talent transfer. You've got people that are in, you know, probably regional or national h- hockey players, rugby players, maybe at, at, uh, at field, track and yeah. field. And, and, and if you don't draw upon those skill sets, you're, you're leaving something on the table and, uh, and you don't know what it will give you. Yeah. We're heading into the last bit of the podcast this morning so tell us how Janine did in that very first year when you coached her from February yeah so uh so from from February you know she she just grew up she just worked really hard you know I'd love to say that there was some uh really yeah really amazing (laughs) secret uh but but she you know she worked hard and and she she'd worked at making herself obviously a better athlete you know, all around in terms of how she moves and how strong she was and her nutrition and like little bits of just a little bit everywhere. And, mm. and, and then just put, you know, said, I want to do that. You know, she never said, I want to be world champion. I, yep. I, we never really had that conversation. Um, we just said how good, you know, I want to be as good as I can be <laughs> and see what I can do. And and then it started to see, like, in training, the performances started to be, or I wouldn't say we had any particularly great benchmarking tools. I mean, we were, we were on a five-and-a-half-kilometre lake with no boy mark, you know, with no markers and no, you know, nothing really tangible to measure anything of, no... Uh, biomechanical equipment the ergo is the ergo um and it's more i see it more as a tool a a training tool necessarily than always a testing tool um uh but it just it started to look to me it looked very good you know it just started to look like the boat would just keep running someone that's really happy in their boat and comfortable in that in who they are and love doing what they're doing and and it got to the the selection trial and i was like you know then i i had to make a decision of you know which crews you know who would coach which crews and and she just stood out and i and i remember that conversation you know her asking me the week before i arrived yes you know this was someone that really wanted to do it and had done everything i'd been there on the first day had done everything asked of them Mm. and i was like you know this is someone that i i really want to coach uh and and she was selected in the single again which wasn't really a surprise um and that's when we we took a, you know, I became her formal coach, so to speak, uh, crew coach, as you would call it in most, most countries. Uh, and, and that's when the, you know, we started to go on this journey and, and really, uh, take that step towards the first world cup, which was really, uh, you know, for me the, as a, as a, new coach to a country to an organization to to go to world cup and uh or almost finish top of the medal table um was just fantastic and i think you know we won like six medals or seven medals um and 
a few golds. Yeah, we won the men's and women's single. Uh, I think we got silvers in the silver in the men's double or bronze in the men's double and the lightweight men's single and like women's single uh we we got got medals as well and it was just you know it was an incredibly hard weekend in that there were two coaches for 20 athletes and it rained for more or less <laughs> the entire entire time we didn't have any time to you know we had time for one sentence uh to the athletes before each race and yeah. run run the shoes back to the pontoon back to the next one and it just really reminded me of being a school coach uh, uh and it was great and but it just it showed how we developed a team where we we knew what we wanted to do we knew what we were about and we were all in it together and and we we knew we had to get on with it and and everyone i think you know would say that that was a that was a great a great regatta and uh, a great stepping stone for what was to come next really and and that was uh, a, a great time so last five minutes yeah the world camps that year were where uh sarasota ah so you went yeah. to the and, Sorry, it was, I that. and it was humid yeah 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 it was uh it was a totally different climate uh yeah we'd spent our preparation camp in Evis, uh in portugal and dry uh, heat so dry yeah. heat but but incredible heat yeah we it was 41 degrees when we were in Evis. uh yeah and everything stopped working yeah, you know, my computer, phone, stopwatch, yeah, the whole thing. Uh, so it was really, um, yeah, it was good preparation, but getting to Florida was uh, really different. <laughs> uh, but we were well prepared. Yeah, you know, we had, um, yeah, you know, we had a good camp in Oak Ridge in Tennessee, um, which was a kind of compact, a nice transition. Yeah, you know, it still could be hot and humid, but it was not like going straight to Florida, which is is obviously another level. That's right. Just sorry, just a bit of power. I thought of power. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a so, world championship medal came. Yeah, yeah, it was a great. Uh, it was a great regatta you know it, it started to come you know we arrived it got the first you know you get the first races done and you don't really you know you're just trying to you're taking things not even one race at a time you're taking things one stroke at a time um and there were a lot of crews there and there were still only two of us coaching um so there was a lot yeah there was a lot of management um and I had a lot, I in particular had a lot of crews that were racing the same, a very similar schedule. Right. So I'd have like three crews on the same day, all with the biggest rounds with heats, quarters, semis. Um, That's what happens, isn't it, Robin? <laughs> it, yeah, that is what happens. But, it, you know, it was great to be part, you know, Bill Lucas was my assistant coach and and Christian Stoffer was his performance director and you know to deliver that championship with so many crews was a absolutely phenomenal achievement from all, all of the people all of the athletes and and coaches and staff and we worked you know it was it was really great but seeing Janine progress through that regatta you know she'd had she had had six or seven weeks out in the season with a broken rib um after that first world cup she you know we found out that she'd taken a not so good good stroke and and had a problem and that turned into a bit of a longer problem than we than we thought um but then you know it was a long year because the championships weren't till october and so we you know we ended up uh you know, being where we wanted to be when it mattered. And, uh, and that was just a commitment to those processes that, that 
were laid out right at the beginning and and i would just keep coming back to those you know that's a really fundamental part of whatever journey you're on whether you're rowing or doing any sport or in your business or workplace you know yeah you have to have this process in place and you have to stick together on that journey otherwise you 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 don't get the rewards for what you put in you'll be putting in an unbelievable amount of work and be getting very little back and and if you can have a clear process and work together then you you can really move forwards and make really good good progress and that's what you'll find is the motivating factor for your boat to go faster (laughs) certainly is yeah you're still working with janine now um yeah are you what are you guys targeting is the european championships going to happen this year well um yeah so in terms of what that looks like with with janine is so now i i run a uh i'm a rowing performance consultant um and that's under my my business dal performance uh, dot com mm-hmm. and that that opens it up to a few more people than just Janine but you know in terms of you know the main focus is is obviously Tokyo 2021 20, 20. <laughs> uh, um and with the Europeans, I mean, I'm hoping that we will get to go there and race and and use that as our kind of toe in the water to see where we're at. Um, because obviously there hasn't been any racing. There's been some access to training, um, some sort of training, uh, which is very similar to everyone else. Um, and And I think that it would be really helpful to be able to see where we're at just so that we can plan the next steps. Um, and, and I think it would just be fun to be honest. And, and I think that's, um, that's what it all comes back to. And if you can keep having fun doing what you're doing, then you, you're going to go faster in the end. Um, and, and the Europeans is a really good, uh, good opportunity for that. But I, I just, I really hope that, uh, we all keep everything, nice and locked down in Europe for as long as it needs because uh, I know it's tempting to to get out there and and uh, travel and you know mingle and catch up with people that you haven't seen but I, I, you know there's it every day in Switzerland we see this bit of in the news and things might not be as as stable as they as they seem yet um because there's an awful lot of us and the borders are very open so it's just it's just the way it is and we can't help it but we can we can hope and stay safe and look after each other for the long term and hopefully we get to see some rowing boats go fast (laughs) well on that note i wish you all the best for the future um for janine for all your other athletes robin Thank you so much for coming and telling us and reminding us how the importance of the fundamentals, the importance of the learning and skill development ladder that every athlete and every coach needs to go through and the opportunities that we all have of learning from each other and learning from outside rowing in other sports and other life skills. You've said anyone can get in touch with you at dowelperformance.com. Do you have a Facebook or an Instagram as well? Yeah, so my uh, Instagram is at Dal Performance and mm-hmm. my Twitter is at Dal Performance One. Ah, that's okay. Good. And uh, my personal Twitter is at Robin underscore Dowell. So they can catch me on there. Um, but yeah. Also, uh, email is is easy as well, but uh, that's just robin at dowperformance.com. But uh, happy to you know reach out, ask any questions you want. Uh, we've got some stuff on the Instagram, which has uh, been answering some some uh, people's questions that they they've posted. Uh, and trying to create a library of uh, resources and infographics around training uh, for people to to take away and use in their own 
in their own daily daily life okay and there's a, a bunch of other services on the website but um it's really about trying to offer something that's more bespoke for for the individual and not um not too prescriptive it's just more trying to help you from where you're at rather than try and put you in a box uh so i, I really enjoyed my my time on the chat and uh I'll definitely be uh, carry on as an avid listener. Uh, I've been digging into quite a lot of the episodes and uh, and uh, always learn something. So thank you very much for having me and uh, I hope to be able to come back sometime soon. I look forward to that too. And to all of our listeners, thank you for coming along for the journey. <laughs> Remember, if you've enjoyed this, please share the episode onto your social media. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>